Old Wolf, Chapter 31. Neshoba could not tell where the pain in his body began, nor where it ended. He kept trying to move, but could not. He worked to open his eyes, but failed. He was not sure where he was or how much time was passing. All that he felt was pain, a universe of hurt, and he was the center of it. Then some th someone was licking his muzzle. Sensing another lick, he struggled to open his eyes and managed a squint. Tonigan was standing over him, bending so close he could feel her breath on his eyes. She licked him again. Neshoba lifted his head a few inches off the ground and realized that the other wolves were standing around him, watching. How? How did we do? He managed to ask. Tonigan said they all got away. All? All. Nothing taken? No reply. It was answer enough. The effort to speak drained Neshoba of energy. He closed his eyes and lowered his head to the earth. He breathed deeply. It was a bad plan, said a voice. Neshoba knew it was Garby. The old wolf wanted to curl his lips in disgust and show his teeth. The gesture was beyond him. You're too old, Neshoba, called Garby. Useless. You let a stupid cow knock you down. Neshoba waited a few moments, gathered some strength, and replied, I ordered you to wait for me before attacking. The pack should attack with strength, not weakness, Garby returned. Neshoba let the words settle. Then he said, what happened? When you failed, said Garby, it threw everything into confusion. They were able to get away. So you too got nothing, said Neshoba. Because you failed, snapped Garby. Pain prevented Neshoba from responding. But from now on, Garby continued, we'll have strength to lead us. I am the pack leader now. Neshoba peeked up into Tonigan's face. He saw his hurt reflected in her eyes. Full of anger, the old wolf pushed down with his front legs so he could stand and confront Garby. The effort brought agony. Collapsing, he lay on the ground, panting. Give up, Neshoba, said Garby. You can't do anything. As the wolves lingered, Neshoba had a thought. Are they waiting for me to die? He lifted his head again. Is this what you all want, he whispered. You want Garby to lead? Pilldown spoke gently. Neshoba, we must find food. I can still hunt, the old wolf said. No, you can't, said Garby. I have one more kill in me, Neshoba said, managing with great effort to look right at Garby. Try, said the young wolf, and he drew close. Neshoba attempted to clear his mind of the hatred he felt toward Garby. He could not. All he said was, go away, all of you. None of the wolves moved. Neshoba lifted his head a few inches. Go, he barked in a burst of breath. Leave me alone. He rested his snout on the snow-covered ground between his two large front paws and breathed deeply. Neshoba heard the wolves move away. He sensed that only Tonigan remained. She pressed her nose into his ear while making a small whining sound. I'll come back, she said. Go, whispered Neshoba, not even looking at her. Tonigan, barked Garby. Hurry, we need to go after those elk. Neshoba made no effort to watch them leave. Instead, he stared at the snow right before him. It was pink, stained with his own blood. Blowing snow tickled his eyes, causing him to blink. He gave a deep sigh. The pain in his leg pulsed with the beating of his heart. All he wanted was sleep. Chapter 32. In the middle of the night, Casey woke to the ringing of the house phone. He assumed, because it happened with some regularity, that his father was being called for a power problem. His, he eyed his digital clock, 320 in blood red numbers. Half awake, half asleep, Casey listened to his dad's voice but couldn't make out his words. He did hear his mother calling, be safe. Casey listened to his father's truck rumble and then within moments heard the dis diminishing sound of it crunching down the dirt road. The silence returned. Casey rolled from bed, raised the blinds and looked out the window. Only a few flakes of snow were falling. High in the sky hung a crescent moon. Streaks of dark clouds moved slowly across its pale yellow face. The moon glow was bright enough to cast long purple shadows like reaching fingers across the silvery snow. Thinking it's going to be a good day for hunting, Casey went back to bed, forgetting to pull the blinds down, and quickly fell asleep. Chapter 33. Flakes of cold snow fell on Neshoba's face and brought him back to the world. He heard the flap of wings. It took him some moments to grasp that Merlot was standing before him, hearing more fluttering. He supposed the other ravens had gathered and were looking down at him. Is he dying? He heard one ask. Could be, Merla replied. How long will it take? Asked another. Don't know, said Merla. Neshoba assumed they were waiting so they could feast on him. Ravens, which lived on dead things, always st started with the eyes. Neshoba squeezed his shut. 
wondering if he would ever awaken, he slept. Chapter 34. Caw! A sharp poke in the nose woke Neshoba. Through barely open eyes, he became aware that there was early morning light. Wolf! came a cry and another peck. Are you alive? Neshoba focused and saw Merla standing before him at eye level, her head cocked slightly to one side. She was observing him. In the pure white of the surrounding snow, her blackness was absolute, her ebony eyes fierce. She was about to peck Neshoba again when he saw his eyes were open. Ah, the raven exclaimed, not dead. Not yet, Neshoba rumbled, aware now that his entire body hurt, a misery of pain, stiffness, and weakness. But not very alive, said the raven, bobbing her head. Neshoba opened his eyes wider, but quickly closed them against the flare of the glistening snow. How long have I been here, he asked, his eyes slits. All night, said Merla, sun's up, snow stopped, blue skies, might be a fine day, unless it rains, don't you think? Neshoba said nothing. He sensed that he was lying in inches of snow. He did not care. He opened his mouth wide and yawned. He moved his ears, neck, and tail. Finally, he tried to move his legs one at a time, starting from the rear. Everything seemed to work except his right front leg and paw. The pain was extreme from the shoulder down. For some moments, he lay quietly, becoming aware that he was terribly thirsty. Leaning forward, he stuck out his tongue and lapped the snow before him. It was good, but not enough. Merla watched him with interest. Do you want to tell me what happened, she asked. No, said the wolf. Ignoring him, the raven said, a complete bungle. Once again, she bobbed her head in self-agreement. I need water, said the wolf. There's a creek not far. Can you stand? Neshoba had to think about it. Then he made the effort the way he always did by pushing down with his front legs. He rose a few inches, but the pain was so intense he dropped down quickly. Try again, said the raven. Resting a moment to let the hurt subside, Neshoba thought that what he thought about what he might do, could do. Taking a deep breath, he pressed upward with his rear legs, lifting his rump first. Then he shoved down only, using only his left front leg. Despite the searing pain, he started to rise, managing to get about six inches off the ground, then lost his balance and fell. I can't stand, he said and gasped. Caw, cried the white raven. You are a mess. Neshoba stayed still for a few long moments, breathing deeply telling himself there was no way to avoid pain, that he had to accept it. He had made another effort to stand, and he fell again. Pretty pathetic, said Merla. Haven't you anything better to say, Neshoba muttered. I always tell the truth. I don't want to hear it, cried the wolf. Caw, answered the raven. Creatures never want the truth about themselves, only others. You are boring, said Neshoba. Wisdom is always boring, taunted the raven. That's why no one listens to it. Neshoba said nothing. Merla remained in place, watching over him. After a while, Neshoba said, I need water. Here, said the bird. With that, she squatted, spread her wide black wings, and swept snow into the wolf's face. Startled, Neshoba pulled back, only to realize what the bird had done. There was now a pile of snow before his nose. He stretched out his snout and lapped it up. Then he said, and something to eat. The raven bobbed her head a third time. You're very demanding, she said. Neshoba grunted. Be right back, said Merla. Don't go anywhere. With that, she spread her wings and flew away. Neshoba, wondering at the bird's sense of humor, had no idea where she was going. <laughs>